Um, today I am going to talk about making a live event quest in EQ2. This is a Tinkerfest quest. Tinkerfest, if you're not familiar with EQ2, uh, Tinkerfest is a gnomish festival that celebrates all things tinkered. Um, it was actually originally a player created event in EQ1 um, on the Feriona V server. A group of gnomes called themselves the Gnomish Pirates uh, used to run a number of fun events such as hijacking the ships in EQ1 and just singing pirate songs for the entire half hour or whatever it was that it took players on the ships to uh, cross between islands. Um, just generally having a lot of fun. And they came up with this idea for Tinkerfest, which was just a server-wide festival. They went to the raiding guilds, asked for donations of any leftover loot that the raiding guilds didn't want, um, that they could use in giveaways. Um, they tried to um, they tried to crash Steamfont by setting off as many fireworks as possible at one time. They, uh, pardon me, they made a number of player-run quests, um, and they did this for probably f at least four years, maybe more, um, every year and it was always very popular. And uh, when we were looking for some more festivals to add um, to liven up the year in EQ2, there was kind of an empty area around sort of the July, August, September area where there wasn't really a natural holiday or anything that was a global event that would make sense um, to make into a, a seasonal event. Um, so the topic of Tinkerfest came up. A few of us were aware of it. I obviously was one of them. I had participated in some of the originals, and uh, we decided to add it in the game. I got to help out with some of that initial content. Quite a few of the Tinkerfest quests, um, certainly in the early years, um, were made by me, um, but other people certainly contributed as well. Several are by Keith Thiel. Um, one, at least one of them was done by an apprentice um, who was uh, just learning on the team part-time. Uh, but this year's quest, there's a new quest, and that one was made by me. I managed to sneak it in in my spare time, went in on a couple weekends to get it done just because I love Tinkerfest and it's fun. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about making that quest. Hopefully this is somewhat interesting, but uh, if it's not, there are lots of other EQ2 and Landmark streams going on, I'm sure. All right, so I'm going to ride my amazing little Bovok mount here. I am currently in Steamfont Mountains, which is Gnomish gnomish land basically. In EQ1 it's where you found Akanon, the gnomish city, um, but somewhere between EQ1 and EQ2 um, the clockworks got out of hand in Akanon and uh, they took over and the gnomes themselves were forced to flee and they've set up what they call gnomeland security up here in this little area in the mountains outside of Akanon which the clockworks have renamed to Clackanon so this is where Tinkerfest is now celebrated, and there are little Tinkerfest decorations in every area of Norath where there's any concentration of gnomes, and there should be a portal in each of those areas that will take you directly to this main center. But you'll see there's lots going on, fireworks, cog decorations, quest givers. Many of these are quests from previous years, and merchants that you can buy cool stuff to put in your house or whatever. Um, so I wanted to add another quest, just to add a little fun this year, something new. So I talked to Kathiel and um, talked about some of the previous years of Tinkerfest quests and whether he had any ideas. And he had mentioned that a couple years ago he had added a quest um, where you got to collect the pages um, to make a book that contained a bit of the history of Meldrath. Meldrath was a very not nice gnome. Well, he was actually... Um, has actually got a bit of a more complicated history than that, but you can do the quest and read the book if you want all of it. Uh, but basically there is um, this fellow called Meldrath who was in EQ1 um, and is also in EQ2. He's got a little dungeon instance um, off the side of Steamfont Mountains where you can go in and you fight your way into the dungeon and you meet, uh, you meet the ghost of Meldrath, or he looks like a ghost, and he sort of talks to you now and then as you progress through the dungeon and you find a number of gears around the dungeon, or batteries, I think they are, one or the other. Anyway, you give them to a clockwork down at the bottom, and the clockwork slowly builds a bridge that allows you to get into a final room where you find um, a ruined clockwork, or a clockwork that's partially assembled, and um, you find Meldrath there, the ghost of Meldrath, 
um, possessing that clockwork so that he can take, presumably take over Steamfont again or whatever evil plans he has. Um, he's got this clockwork repaired and he's going to possess it with his ghost or spirit or whatever he is and uh, cause lots of mischief. So of course you have to fight this big clockwork and you destroy it and then the, you've defeated the ghost and he can't do anything. So that's a dungeon instance that was added in Expansion 3, uh, the Echoes of Fadewer. And uh, you can still do it, it's kind of fun, but I thought it might be nice to kind of flash back to that in this quest. So what I did was I ran through that instance and I replayed it so I remembered the details. And then I read all of the stuff that Kayfiel had um, done in previous Tinkerfest just to make sure that I was, you know, not contradicting anything he'd said and getting ideas from it. And then I decided it would be fun. What if we went back into that instance and we met Meldrath again? So I started out just writing an outline. Now, usually when I am creating a quest, and I can't speak for any other designers, but probably I'm not the only one. First, I'll just start out reading all of the lore, all of the story, um, playing the content in the game that's relevant to what I'm going to write a quest about. So in this case, I played through the Meldrath dungeon. I read all of the stuff, read the history of Meldrath, etc., etc., or all of the story that's out there already. Then I start forming ideas about where a new story would fit into that. I also want to think about what the goal of this quest is. And quests can have lots of different goals. Sometimes they are specifically to reward something cool. For example, an epic quest, basically the whole point of an epic quest um, is to award your epic weapon for your class. Um, so those are very oriented to your class and very, uh, very focused on weapons and fighting and so on, depending on what the weapon is. Um, others maybe uh, an introduction to a new expansion, maybe their prelude quests or introductory quests that lead you through the story of the new area, um, lead you how to get there, stuff like that. Uh, this one being a seasonal live event quest is really just for fun. It doesn't have a huge amount of purpose. You don't have to do it. If you don't do it, you're not losing out on anything. There's no super valuable reward, uh, just some fun items, um, but that makes it very very easy to do pretty much anything that seems like fun in the quest. So that said, what I usually do is start a notepad and just write down some ideas. So what I thought was that we would have the player tricked somehow by the ghost of Meldrath to do all the work rebuilding that clockwork that players had previously destroyed in the dungeon. And then that would end with the clockwork being rebuilt and the player not being quite sure what they'd done. I probably should have prefaced this with spoilers, but this has been live for the whole of last weekend on EQ2, so hopefully if you were really worried about spoilers you have done it already. <clears throat> so I called the quest, we can rebuild, and I started out just doing an outline. So let's see. The end we know is we want to rebuild Meldrath's clockwork, which is actually called the King's Gift. It was originally a massive clockwork that was a gift to um, the King of Akanon, I believe. And keep in mind, when I did this, it was about March or April, I think. Um, so I haven't actually looked at it since April, <laughs> so my memory is a little rusty. It takes pretty much that long to get content in for a live event. This one went live um, last weekend, so mid-July. Um, the actual quest was made late April, I think, was the final submission. All right, so we finish up by rebuilding Meldrath Clockwork, and the player going, what did I do? and is left in a bit of doubt. So how do we get there? Now I have to think through this. Well, at some point we have to enter the dungeon where Meldrath is and talk to the ghost. We know the ghost tricks the player into helping rebuild. And we know that the player does stuff to rebuild clockwork. And in this case, stuff is going to be most of what you're doing in the quest. And it's a very short quest. It's not going to be very complicated. So I just figured, okay, in the previous dungeon, 
the original one with expansion 3, the player goes through and destroys the clockwork. There would be a group of players, a group in EQ2 is six people typically, and they would destroy the clockwork and they'd loot it and get whatever it dropped. So let's say when you go into this dungeon, you are actually trying to recover all of the bits of the clockwork that the players might have looted. So recover the clockwork parts that players looted. And to do that, well, maybe the players are still in there. What if we have an adventuring party that's obviously has just killed the clockwork and they're just wandering around, probably heading towards the exit, maybe picking up shinies? Defeat the party of adventurers. <clears throat> so there we have the very basic outline already. That's what our quest is going to be. Um, it's kind of fun because you actually get to fight adventurers, which is kind of the reverse of how you would normally play the game. Um, and you get to uh, see a little more of Meldrath's story. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Sorry, just distracted by chat. So, um, what are we going to do now? I have to go through all the details of this and that's where most of the time uh, goes into building a quest. Depending on the game and the back end of the game, it can be very different. EQ2 um, has a system based on XML files, so pretty much every um, everything in the game is a different file. Whereas uh, Landmark EQ Next is a database based game, so every thing in the game is generally a new line in an appropriate database table. For example, a character in EQ2, the Meldrath character, for example, would be a separate file called Meldrath with all of his associated details. Whereas in um, EQ Next Landmark, it would be a line in a character table with the same type of details. Um, exactly how different games handle these things is not really relevant. It all works the same way. So that doesn't really matter one way or the other. Different games probably use some combination of those two. Uh, but basically I would go through and I would start making all the characters. I would make all the character files or entries in the database depending on what game I was doing it for. I would also make the actual quest file and the quest file would essentially start with this stub of the quest, which I will then flesh out. After making all the characters, then I make all of their dialogue, which means writing out every single thing that they can say to you and you can say to them. EQ2 has the dialogue node system where you actually talk to people and a little speech bubble pops up and you can choose what reply you want. So you can have a fairly complex branching conversation. And there are some actually pretty funny ones around here in Steam font. Um, but other games, um, some other games are much more simple. They don't allow branched conversations. It's just like big in your face quest offer thing, which doesn't give as much flexibility for jokes and things. I quite like EQ2s, but it does take a little longer to write the dialogue. All right, so having made the dialogue, then I would make any NPC characters, non-player characters. In this case, all of the adventurers, Meldrath. I have to figure out how you're going to get the quest. Um, if there are any objects in the quest, for example, the gears or whatever. Then again, in the EQ2 system, this would be a separate file for each. Um, then I would have to make how you get into the zone out of it. Typically um, in EQ2 and in most MMOs, you would click an item to enter a zone, such as clicking on a door or a teleporter or something like that. Possibly someone might speak to you and teleport you through a dialogue node. However it is, I need to make that. Um, I need to make the zone. I need to make any custom decorations in the zone. And when I say make the zone, uh, because I'm using the same dungeon that the original defeating Meldrath instance is in. I don't need a brand new zone with a brand new look, but I need to make a new copy of it with new stuff in it that's specific for this quest. And it has a custom name probably. Um, and then I need to make any rewards for the quest and so on. I'm probably forgetting a few things, but that's 
the basics. So let's uh, let's take a look at the class. And I believe is it this house or that house. No, it was not this house. See, I don't even remember which house I put it in now because it was April and I literally have not had time to look at it yet. Here we go. I'm going to get off my mount even though I love him because he's kind of big and his butt gets in the way. All right, so I've walked into this cozy little gnome home. And here I see the usual guys who are normally in here. But here I see this guy offering a quest and he's not usually here in Steam Font. Tinker Thermold. Well, he's dressed like a Tinkerfest celebrant. He's doing the same kinds of things, like drinking, that they generally do. Um, so I'm going to assume that he's just another Tinker. Although, if you actually ran his name through an anagram, you might find it's a little suspiciously similar to Meldroth. I'm going to talk to this guy. Oh, happy Tinkerfest. You look like a fine, brave type who could use a strong drink, am I right? And then here's the dialogue options that I mentioned. Uh, you could do has, so I can choose you are very right, or no thank you. And if I choose no thank you, that's just going to exit and nothing more will happen. But obviously I want to do the quest, so hail him again. You look like a fine, brave type who could use a strong drink, am I right? Yes, Tinker Thermald, you are very right. Click on that one. Excellent, then let's celebrate Tinkerfest with my special cask strength gnomish spirits. Help yourself from the barrel here, if you dare. Sounds good to me. And now I get my quest offer. New quest, we can rebuild. Um, this quest actually scales to my character's level. The character I'm currently on is level 92, but if I were level 8, the quest level would display as level 8. And that's something we usually do for the special seasonal event quests. We wouldn't usually do it uh, for normal adventuring quests, obviously. So I get a little brief description of the quest, which is basically what he just told me, and I can see my reward is going to be a cask of gnomish spirits to put in my house. Ah, okay, cool. I like house items. I'm going to accept the quest. Tinker Thermald has put down his cask strength gnomish spirits, and as I mouse over it, I have added a little warning sign. This specially insulated jug contains special brew cask strength gnomish spirits. Side effects may include inebriation, disorientation, unconsciousness, or delirium. All right, so pretty standard for a gnomish drink, really. So I'm going to click, and oh, there I am drinking. And oh dear, suddenly what's happened? That was very strong gnomish spirits. And here I am zoning. You can see the zone name here, a dream of clockwork. So all right, I guess I passed out from the gnomish spirits, right? Right. Here I am. Oh, waking up. If I look in my quest journal, I can actually see my latest update, the details, because there's a little more detail in the quest journal than you see in the quick helper on the side. After drinking the gnomish spirits, everything went blurry and I'm not sure where I am. Hopefully someone can tell me. And then just the little shortcut text here in my quest helper just says, what strange dream is this? Well, I can bring up the map doesn't really help much. I can see that I'm in a zone called a dream of clockwork. And I can see there's a ghost over here. Oh, he's a dream figment. Of course, this is a dream. So let's see what he has to say. He seems to be standing by a ruined clockwork. Ah, there you are, Domino. It's been a long time since you've dreamed of me. And my response, it has? Am I dreaming? Who are you? Relax, of course you're dreaming. We're old friends, you and I. No need for questions in a dream. And what dream do you think this is today? And I had a little fun with these answers here. Is it the one about the dancing high elves? That's for you, Jaskar. Not the one where I turn up to a raid with no armor on, I hope. Or I can choose, is it the strange one about the flying duck mounts? And around the time I was making this quest is just when the duck mounts were being released. So that was just a little joke for Tom Toby. So which one am I going to choose? Um, I'm going to say it's not the one about the dancing high elves, is it? 
And in fact, in this case, it doesn't actually matter which one you say. He's going to answer the same thing, but I could have added a few more details. So he says, ha, huh, that's a great dream. But no, today is the dream where you are a hero and you help me, your best friend. Are you ready? My response, I don't remember this dream, but I guess so. I knew I could count on you and you're going to be my hero when you help me repair this highly valuable broken clockwork. It was a gift from the king. You're going to find the pieces to fix it. And where am I going to find those? The troublemakers who broke this clockwork each took a valuable component to sell. They should still be nearby. All you have to do is get the components back from them. Then this dream ends well. Okay then, I'll go find them. I also added an option here. No, I don't think so. I want to wake up now, which will send you back to Steam Font and you can delete the quest if you want. But no, obviously I want to go find them. So off we go. He's just told me that his, he's my good friend in, his, in this dream, that I dream of him regularly, that he needs my help, and that if I find the pesky adventurers who stole his clockworks, the dream will end well. So of course I'm going to help him. One thing that I try to do in this, well, in any quest, is even though I want usually the players to take certain choices and move in a certain direction, it needs to be something that, regardless of the player's alignment, um, they're okay with doing. Um, so I couldn't necessarily have a goody-goody high elf saying, I want you to pick flowers for me, because the evil characters would not want to do that. So in that case, I would either change the quest, so that's not what you do, or I would give some alternate options that if you're an evil character, maybe you have a different option of talking to a troll and helping him pick mushrooms or something, um, or something like that. Um, you never want the person playing to feel like they're doing something their character wouldn't do because that takes them out of the story. All right, so I'm going to go and look through this dungeon. And as I'm walking, there were a couple questions in chat. Um, Delmon asked, question about the clickable gnomish spirits. For items like that that magically appear, are they always there and hidden as if uh, by a, an if on quest clause, or are they created when you reach that point in the quest? Uh, it can depend. Uh, in that particular case, it really is there all the time. You can only see it, however, when you're on the correct stage of the quest. Um, but sometimes we can actually spawn things, um, such as, for example, when um, when a skeleton pops up and it attacks you when you're on a certain quest. That wouldn't be there all the time. You don't want invisible attackable skeletons hanging around all over the server, even if they you know, aren't going to be visible. Um, so those ones we can cause to appear. Um, it depends a little bit on exactly how we want it to behave and exactly what it is. So if you're familiar with the original Meldrath instance, you may recognize this bridge. This is the bridge that you give the things to the clockwork to build. So we're basically going the reverse um, of where the original dungeon took us. In the original dungeon, you had to build this bridge, and then you went into this end room, and that was the end of the instance. So this one, we've started out in the end room, and now we're going out backwards. And I can see, just peering over from here, I can see there's some random clockworks left over. Clearly our adventuring group did not clear the zone very well. But over here I can see an adventurous fighter. And he's marked with my little quest feather, so I know I need to kill him. Uh, but even if I didn't, Meldrath had told me that <clears throat> over here on my quest helper I can see a fighter took the cog he needs, and he's got a whole list of six classes, all of which I am going to need to attack. So here we go. Let me see if I remember how to play this wizard because it's been a little while. This is not my main character. She's only 92. My main is my dirge, who's a little higher level. All right, so look, I looted a king's cog. Loot that. My quest updated. And I spy over here an adventurous wizard. Each of them, I made a different class and race, just for fun. 
my wizard here is a gnome. Oops, got an ad. Ooh, an ad with knockback. How rude. I don't have my UI set up at all on this uh, character. I guess, uh, I guess I haven't really played her since I got this new computer, which wasn't that long ago. But there we go. The king's... This valuable mechanism was once part of a very powerful clockwork. All right, that's two down. Now I'm not sure. Let's see. Not sure if I made these guys see in biz, so let's try sneaking around invisibly. Looks like that one does see invisible. I'm gonna stand here for a second. Oh no, I'm not gonna stand here for a second. Alright. Apparently they have a bigger aggro range than I realized. If I had stayed out of aggro range and watched for a little while, um, you might see that they actually occasionally say different things. My scout here, who's a halfling, would say slightly different things than the other characters. If you let them wander around, they'll stay basically in the area that I found them. But they will say things like, ooh, just one more shiny before I leave, or... Um, I'm trying to remember now what I said. I think the wizard says something about, what does he mean, don't pull aggro? And the uh, the scout says something about always getting lost, I remember. Um, and the priest complains, I believe, about never people never staying in a healing range and so on. I think the coercer complains about people breaking mez. They've each got three or four random lines that they may say um, if they're just wandering around doing nothing else. Most people won't notice it, but... Sometimes you do want to like to have a little fun like that. I know Delmon, who's in chat, pointed out in a previous Tinkerfest quest that I'd done, um, a couple of the a couple of the commented things um, were computer geek jokes, um, which I did put in there just to see if anyone noticed. All right, I see the bard. I made the bard an ogre just for fun. Not a very usual choice for a bard. He's looking for a shiny. Oh, not really an adventure worth singing about. It's one of his random callouts. Now he's having a drink. So yeah, I like little little flavor things like that. Just add a bit of fun. Probably ninety five percent of people never notice them, but the ones who do hopefully get a laugh. All right, got the resistor. So that's four down, two to go. I'm not a Tracking class. Actually, huh, I am a halfling though, and they gave halflings tracking, I think, as a racial ability recently. Well, by recently, I mean probably in the last few years. Alright, there's my coercer though. Just, this is normally where you would enter in the adventuring instance. You'd come in here and head this away. So now I believe I just need to find the last one out here. 
And I put the adventurers spread out around the dungeon. I wanted there to be a little bit of work. I mean, it's not supposed to be a hard quest or particularly challenging. It's just for fun, but you don't want it to be over instantly either. He's down here. Yep. And there's the priest. And he's looking for shinies too. Made him a Karen. I think. Yeah. I have no idea why I chose a Karen. Is he gonna say something? No, he's just flexing. All right, we're going to kill him. And there we go. And I got the capacitor. Now I need to return to my dream friend. Didn't need to use tracking after all. sometimes when you have made a quest but it's been a long time since you looked at it or played it you can still sometimes be surprised and completely not remember things that you know that you actually must have done yourself uh, or maybe that's just my terrible memory but I find that sometimes I'll run through a trade school quest line and I have no memory of some of the things I wrote um, oh, another question from chat. Uh, when you're building quests that involve combat, how much thought and tuning goes into that, say, for more friendly live events versus day-to-day -day play? Are there tools to help you gauge difficulty setting, or do you wing it and then tune from there? Um, well, there's a few questions in that. Uh, obviously, um, I think if you've played a lot of EQ2, you're probably familiar with live event um, seasonal type quests. They do tend to be easier, as you can see. I kind of strolled through that dungeon. It was not as challenging by far as the actual adventuring dungeon would have been. Had I been the appropriate level, I would have needed, you know, a full group, or at least a partial group. And uh, the end boss would have been a bit of a challenge, and it would probably have taken half an hour. Uh, but, let's see. Um, we can set things at a default. Um, when we're creating an enemy that you're going to attack, we can set the specific level, you can say you are going to be level 70. That obviously doesn't work very well for a quest which scales to your level. I'm level 92, I don't want to be fighting level 70 dream, dream adventurers. If I were level 9, I would never be able to finish the quest if they were all level 70. So they need to scale relative to my level um, if the quest does. Um, and then So we can set them to scaling, by default they will match our level, but we can then say um, match level plus however many, so plus five. You'll notice that all of the actual adventure characters were orange to me, so I believe we added like one or two levels um, above my level. I can also adjust the tier of the monsters, whether they're like the solo mob or whether they're a heroic mob. Um, whether I could even make them a raid mob. There are some quests where I've actually made things raid mobs because you're not supposed to fight them at all. Um, they're just supposed to look really, really scary or kill you if you go in the wrong place. Um, so there's a lot of leeway for tweaking them. Uh, in this case, I created the layout, and I think I just took the defaults, um, and then when I checked in the quest, I sent it to Kathiel, and I said, hey, um, here you go, here's the basic outline, ready for you to just look through and make sure you're okay with it. Uh, wasn't sure exactly how you're tuning the live event NPCs these days, um, so either let me know and I'll adjust them, or feel free to just tweak them yourself. And I think that he went through and tweaked them a little bit for what was in line with the other live event quests. Um, but as you can see, they are still soloable and they're not too, too challenging. Um, and I don't have particularly amazing equipment. Um, it's okay, but it's not like there's a lot of raid gear, I think. I probably don't have any raid gear at this point. I probably just got the um, Overland Solo Quest gear on this character. Let's see. Are there tools to help you gauge difficulty setting was the other part of the question. Um, I believe there are. Uh, if I were doing like a serious dungeon, which is not the type of content that I generally do, 
Um, but if I were a dungeon or a raid designer, they have more tools um, that they can actually uh, get much more information about damages, like parse type information, as well as they would also run through it on the on a test server or a beta server uh, with actual groups of players just to make sure that it's balanced appropriately. And they would pay a lot more attention to that, and they know, in fact, a lot more about that than I have ever needed to. Uh, but yeah, they have, they have a lot of tools at their disposal. All right, Kenzie has come to say hello. Let's see if I could convince her to stay above. All right, so back to my dream friend. He's still with his broken clockwork, looking very sad. Do you have the components yet? My reply, yes. Although I have to say those things hit surprisingly hard for dream figments. And he's like, Shrug, isn't it amazing how real dreams can feel? But good work. Here are all the components needed to repair this glorious clockwork. Let me get to work right now. And off he goes, saying this will only take a moment. And he's walked over to the clockwork. He's doing some little tinkering animation over here. Gonna give him a moment or two. Ha ha! Ha ha ha! The king's gift at last, he says. I don't speak like Meldrath very well. But special effects, and suddenly the clockwork is repaired again. And it's called a possessed clockwork. So this is a little scary. My dream friend has gone. This big clockwork is now in the way. Gonna try and hail him. Ha ha ha! Ha ha ha! At last, the king's gift is restored. Meldrath the malignant will be unstoppable. And then my reply is the player is, uh, what? Did you just possess that clockwork? Who are you? And his reply, don't worry, little mortal. This is all just a dream. You are a mighty hero today, and you'll find out how much soon enough. And my reply, stop! Wait, is this really a dream? Of course, this is all a dream, and it's time to wake up now. Sweet dreams. And he hits me, and boom, I'm blacking out again. And the cat is coming to help. Pardon the cat. And oh, I have woken up on a bed. Where am I? In Steamfont Mountains again. But there's no Tinker Thermold, and no cask of gnome spirits over there. Oh, but there is a concerned gnome. And as I approach, he pops up this dialogue. You're awake. Are you all right? Where am I? What happened? Where's that gnome? What gnome? You were found alone, unconscious on the floor over there. Too much gnomish spirits? My reply, hmm, I guess that must be it. What a strange dream. And his last response, Oh, we found this with you. I guess you dropped it when you passed out. Take care and happy Tinkerfest. I'm glad no harm was done. And my reply, no harm done? I hope you're right. So there's my quest reward. Quest is over. Quest summary is everything after I drank Tinker Thermold's special gnomish spirits is a bit of a confused memory. I dreamed that I helped a ghost repair a mighty clockwork he called a king's gift. I woke up in Steamfont with a very bad feeling about this. I just hope it was a dream. And I've accepted it. I get my house item, which is just the, uh... oh god, my inventory is very full. Just the, um, the cask of gnomish spirits that uh, was over on the floor over there before which I can put in my house as a memory. doesn't do anything. And that was it. Very small quest, very short quest. Uh, hopefully just a little bit of fun. It's just nice to have a little new content each Tinkerfest. It's not meant to be anything huge or major or significant, and if you don't care about getting a house item, you don't have to do it at all. Uh, but there you go. So from just a general idea of, hey, we should do something new and fun, to a quick overview to creating all the files and so on. 
hooking them all up together. Probably takes maybe a week for something like that. It's a little hard to judge because I kind of did this in my lunch hours and a little bit after work and I came in on one weekend to do it. So it was in bits and pieces, but uh, it's not a hugely complex quest. I would think probably a week or so would, would cover it. Um, and I actually printed out the release notes, which I emailed every time we check in a quest. We just send out a release note saying this was checked in, this is what it was, and these are all the files associated with it. Um, as I mentioned in EQ2, generally each item, each part of anything is a separate file. If it were something, uh, if it were a different database based game, then rather than files, it would be probably um, line row entries in tables, but probably about the same number of them. So here is each file. Some of them are wrapping around to the next line, but basically every line is a different file. Page one. Page two, page three, page four. You realize you can't see the details, but just to give you an idea of how many files are involved, page five, and a couple on page six. So that's Quite a few files, just for one little quest that small. So you can imagine how many files are checked in, or in a database-based game, how many rows are added or edited for something massive, like a huge epic quest line, or whatever. Uh, so, just check in. Uh, any further questions in chat? That's pretty much all I was going to say. A little Tinkerfest quest from beginning to end. Hopefully if you play EQ2 you hopped on and got your gnomish spirits and tried some of the other quests too. Hope they were fun. There's also some cool new tinkered items that you can get from the merchant which are new this year as well as some really cool older ones 